Hi everybody, welcome to this Timeline documentary. My name is Dan Snow and here I am in a Lancaster bomber cockpit, one of the few remaining Lancasters from the Second World War, to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hit, it's like Netflix for history. Hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with many of the world's best historians. Follow the information below this film or just search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. We're on the trail of a medieval mystery. This is Zion House, one of the most lavish stately homes in the country, owned by the Dukes of Northumberland. And somewhere under this beautiful parkland lies the remains of an enormous and equally lavish monastery. Founded by Henry V, Zion Abbey, home to an obscure order of Swedish nuns, became one of the wealthiest and most powerful religious establishments in medieval England, a hotbed of political intrigue and dissent. Then, although it survived Henry VIII's dissolution, shortly afterwards, the buildings just vanished. Everything, even its internationally famous library, seems to have disappeared. All we know is that whatever remains of this once fabulous establishment lies hidden somewhere under here. And we've got just three days to find it. We know that Sion was a rich and powerful abbey, and most abbeys conform to a basic layout. A large church where monks or nuns worshipped, surrounded by cloisters where they lived. What we don't know is exactly where the monastic buildings were, or what they looked like. I'm told that the best way to sort out this monastery is to try and locate the abbey church, where the great and the good are buried, and that Geophys are going to help us. Look, just have a look at this for a minute. Geophys are supposed to help us, and there's three of them all sitting down. Have you well, seen the amount of parkland that there is out there? We've been waiting four years for you to come here. What do you mean? Well, we actually did the survey for the estate four years ago. And You've got... done it already? <laughs> that is a cheat! <laughs> no, look, we've got fantastic results. Look at this, archaeology all around the house. It is fantastic, but what does it actually mean? Well, look, I've, I've tried to simplify it. We've got all these formal garden features, and I've tried to ignore these. And if we look at this plot, here I've got all the wall remains, and I'm sure these are monastic. He's very smug, isn't he? <laughs> it looks like we're not going to need any surveyors at all. He's done it all. <laughs> we just got to show how wrong you can be. I'm not so sure we can ignore the garden remains. Got lots of maps and plans here which might help us sort out what some of this stuff is. Well, shall we pull it all together and show <laughs> the others? Miles, I have to say there's a part of me that's a bit sceptical about this dig. We've excavated so many monasteries and stately homes over the years and really found very little. Are we going to turn up much? Well, I would hope so. I mean, John's geophysical results here are, are fantastic. You should be very pleased with them. There's some uh, amazing structural detail still Yeah, but there. it could just be rubbed out walls, couldn't it? But even if the walls have all gone, we'll find the remains of things like stained glass and bits of stonework and stuff in the fabric, so we should turn up a lot anyway. I'm still optimistic that we may actually get the foundations. Let's hope we do. Jonathan, can you see anything there that could be the foundations of the Abbey Church? Well, well, pretty much where we're standing, this side of the house, there's a whole series of what looks like walls here that's either the Abbey Church or a look-alike. Um, you see two side walls down there, inside, I mean they're all lined up, they look like piers. You see little bits coming off them like buttresses. It's got far too vivid <laughs> imagination. Do I, babe? It just can't be. Why? I think the dimensions are too big. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm with John on this one. If you look at this plan of 1739, it shows the layout of rectangular gardens here behind the, the house, which almost exactly matches that. So these features you're pointing to could easily be gardens. John, if that is the church, how big is it? Well, 100 foot. Gosh, it's oh. very big. It is very big. But would is it, it stand up? up? There are churches of 100 feet breadth. They're mostly cathedrals, it must be said, but Henry VI 
the wealthy man and his foundations were enormous. Uh, this is a debate that's going to run and run, isn't it? <laughs> Miles, how are we going to solve all this? Well, the, obviously the key to understanding the site, trying to locate the, um, the cloisters, chapter house, all the other sort of associated buildings, is trying to find the church on the ground. So I think if we can put a, a trench across here, yeah. see this wall, we'll see straight away whether it is a church or whether it is part of a garden feature. So trench one goes in, and the battle begins between Jonathan, architectural historian, who thinks there's a big church here, and John G. Fizz, who thinks it's all too big to be a building and must be a garden feature instead. This disagreement has its roots in the site's history. Sion Abbey was founded by Henry V, but it was his son Henry VI who began construction here. Sion was destroyed shortly after the dissolution of the monasteries when work began on a new house. In the early 1600s, the elaborate and fashionable gardens were added. But 150 years later, Capability Brown totally changed the whole landscape. So the features on the Geophys could just as easily be horticultural as ecclesiastical. John thinks the church could be these features over here and Trench 2 and 3 are going in to investigate. But it's Trench 1 that delivers the first clue. All right, Phil. Yeah, it's going all right, Dan. Look, we're just going straight through the topsoil, straight down onto this white. See, it's got lots of bits of toil and what have you. Cook it on gas, didn't we? We've no idea what's been left in the ground. If the foundations weren't picked clean to build Cyan House, then Capability Brown probably carted the rest away when he landscaped the grounds. The less garden features we get, the better. I don't want any garden features in here. I know it's what makes Stuart tick, because he likes to have a map with a garden feature on it. I don't want any of that one uh, Abbey. Well, ah! Now, what the devil is that? You got the Abbey, Phil? What? Oh, I don't know, but... <laughs> That's a bit more like it, though. Oh, look at... Oh, ah. Oh, we'll have that. We'll have that. That ain't mortared in, but that's demolition, I reckon. But we'll have that. That's her level. Can you get a bit more back here, Pat? Please? Wait. Damn it, oh, he might as well take that off. May as well. Hello, here he comes. Come and have a look at this. We got our garden feature for you. Look at that. that that's that good. That garden feature, is it? That's demolition rubble. Yeah, but but is it church? Well, it, it, ain't, it ain't nothing else, is it? Hey, hang on, Pat. Oh, what? Look at that. Gorgeous floor tile. It's glazed. It is beautiful, isn't it? Our first clue there might be a building here, but is it monastic? It is glazed, look. It's beautiful glaze, isn't it? Sion Abbey was home to a most unusual holy order, dedicated to a 14th century Swedish mystic. After a visitation from Christ, St Bridget built a monastery at Vadstina in Sweden and then travelled around the royal courts of Europe, offering kings and queens a fast track to heaven if they supported her order by founding even more monasteries. Bridget was a saint. She was canonised in 1391. Christ spoke to her in person, so she said, and effectively dictated a brand new rule for a house of monks and nuns. So what was the new rule different to the old rules? It was far more enclosed and far more uh, prescribed and specific about what the, the duties of the monks and nuns should be. So it was a brand new late medieval uh, evolution of monasticism. Why on earth was it the Bridgetine order that was founded here? Well. They, there were two reasons. Um, Henry IV, his sister, married uh, the King of Sweden, and they came across Vadstena, which is the mother house, and sent all the monks and, and some of the nuns over here. Uh, secondly, Henry V wanted to surround his new palace at Sheen with a great monastic landscape. Lots of monasteries yep. and new monasteries yep. worshipping God properly, yes. as it were. The community at Vadstena was a blueprint for subsequent Brigitine foundations. These were double houses where both nuns and monks lived, and their abbey churches were huge. The Vadstina church was nearly 100 metres long. So our church should be similar, if we can find it. Here you are, look. Bit of moulding. Look, nice bit of 
concave moulding on that side, spine down the middle, and then another another concave there. So I suppose there's a bit of window moulding, window dressing probably, something like that. Tracery or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Oh, and another that's a tooled surface oh, there. Yeah. Look, Jonathan will like that. Must have been a gorgeous building, you know. In trench two, they're finding similar stuff. They've got a floor surface and lumps of stonework that also look a bit church-like. Over here is where the 18th century garden features would have been and where John thinks that the abbey church is. But beyond here is where Jonathan thinks the abbey church is. Surely it can't just be on the basis of some rather thin lines on the GFVs. One of the main reasons is because this big, broad feature is on an east-west axis, what you'd expect of a church. Why would it have been that big? You can take nothing here as typical. It's a royal foundation. And when you look at some of Henry VI's other work, um, there's Eton College, as intended by comparison. It's e exactly comparable width for 70 students. So it's not to do with numbers. And would it have been one of those perpendicular, all Gothic, flying buttress types of things? Again, we don't know whether it follows the Swedish mother church in being like a big barn, or whether it's something uh, much, much more typically English in, in, in comparison. But bear in mind, King's College Chapel, Cambridge, Eton, Henry VI making a statement of dynasty um, in it, because his father was the first founder here. So it could be something uh, very, very English looking. At the time of building Sion, Henry VI was a young king and highly influenced by modern contemporary architecture in Europe. He wanted to make his statement in England. He founded Eton College in 1440, followed by King's College Cambridge in 1441. Their chapels were the showpieces. Hi John, you got any results for us yet? John's extended his survey and look what he's got. Go on. <laughs> oh, fantastic. There you are. I mean, just look. Well, that's our returning wall. Hey, well, that's interesting, isn't it? So we, we've made our trench across there, and you've got a new, new returning walls, not far away. But where are the cloisters? Well, we've still got these, these structures coming out down this end, so that's probably going to be our best bet for the uh, finding the cloisters, and so that's where our, our targeted trenches are going in. Our next priority target is to put a trench over that, that corner. That is a buttress there. Yeah. And certainly just getting that 90-degree that turn uh, really just to confirm whether that is an independent building or whether that is still part of a garden feature, but I think um, it's looking far more church now on that one. Well, that could be fun, it couldn't it? If it is a church, it's the east window, cut masonry, stained glass. Yep, that's where the action is. Could be a lot there. So Dan gets our fourth trench underway to locate the end of this mysteriously large structure. If we find a buttress, it may give us a clue as to how big these walls really were. There are robbed out walls emerging from the demolition rubble at either end of Trench 1, and they're over 100 feet apart. If these are the walls of a building, it would have been absolutely enormous, and it's this very scale that's worrying John. But there might just be an answer to that. Phil's discovered a large feature in the middle of the trench. Yeah, see, we've got, look, that stone in there, and that is still mortared stone in there. So what, what do you think it is, Phil, though? It's not a wall. You're talking about it being a, a pier space? Well, what, what it is, is, is right midpoint between the wall at that end and the inner wall on the other end. So it's slap Have you measured it? between this wall here and this middle thing, and, and the inner one on the other side is 54 feet. That's 54 your, feet? 54, that's Jonathan's 100, 108 feet that he started with. OK, I just work in metres, but... You've been saying that you, you, you can't believe that that's a building because it's too wide, there's nothing to support it. That was, with with yeah. masonry like this, you could support it. OK, maybe it is a church. I'm still not convinced, but... This is a very substantial garden wall. Well, there could have been a big statue here, Phil. Oh, ah. A big fountain right in front of the house. Oh, ah. How come in the Middle Ages, a religious house that comprised of women could become so powerful and rich? 
Well, it was under royal patronage. It was an incredibly important place to be from the women's point of view, and it was incredibly important for the king to demonstrate his piety. It's Henry V is ex expiating, really, the sins of his father by setting up not just one, but actually three big religious houses round here. So, in a sense, it's part of the status of the king that the house that he founds here should be very, very successful and well endowed. So, what kind of women would come here and be nuns? Well, the women who have a vocation to start off with, yeah. so you would have people who had a genuine religious vocation. The women who were perhaps determined to be spinsters, didn't want to marry. The women who were unmarriageable for one reason or another, perhaps just awkwardness. Uh, perhaps widows. And anyone who wanted not to be part of the marriage market, of the pawns of the way that women are used in history, but wanted to take, in a sense, a sidestep and control their own destiny a bit more. This could be a career move. It could be a very sensible career move for a scholarly, ambitious, power-hungry woman who could see herself joining the nunnery as a, as a young novice and then working her way up to run what is actually a very big business. If trench one's looking more church-like, then trench two at the side of the house is now looking a bit different. And is this where those ambitious and power-hungry nuns would have paced up and down? I mean, it could still be that elusive cloister yeah. passageway that we've been looking for. Yeah. Um, that's one of our, our best structures outside of the church at the moment. All day, the two Johns have been at loggerheads about whether or not we've found our monastic church. On John Geophysis' side, he thinks the walls we've found are too far apart. It's simply too big. On John Architectural Historian's side, we seem to have three walls of a large building in a monastic complex. So what else could it be? Hopefully, the resolution will emerge right here, Trench 4, which we're putting in bang on top of the corner of whatever this mysterious structure turns out to be. Is it the church? Join us after the break. Beginning of day two, and our archaeologists are still rowing about exactly what we've got in this trench. Is it the largest undiscovered monastic church in Greater London? Or is it just a load of old garden features? Barney, when Jonathan said he thought it was a church, you just laughed. Why are you so sceptical? Well, between the two walls, it's about 35 metres. That is enormous. That's longer than some churches in width. And I don't see anything yet that says to me, church. What would you need to see in order to be convinced that it was a church? Well, I think substantial masonry in situ. Um, we, we've got to have more evidence. We've got no floor levels from inside the church. No graves or anything. Yeah. Why do you still think it's a church? Well, Tony, it does seem to me that all this could be an accident of survival, that one would expect with a huge house being built on the site of a church, they'd rob it pretty cleanly. And having gardens superimposed on the church means we might expect the floor level to be gone. So what I'd like to see is the corner that John's geophysics seems to be coming up with, because to me, this is a massive building. You got very excited yesterday about this feature over here. Why? I did. This came up very late. And, um, of course, what we wanted to find between these two socking parallel side walls, we need some evidence for support of a structure to carry the roof, because it can't possibly span 100 foot yeah. um, with the roof. Now, exactly between those two walls, is this massive foundation. I mean, look at that. Look at the edge there and there. That could be a massive pier base. I this mean. is what's missing from the geophysics, because it's too deep. So I've not had anything in the middle at all. And that's why I've been writing it off. That's why I need imagination. <laughs> Fill in the gaps. Now, look, the before gaps. the two of you start getting too bitchy, <laughs> Yesterday evening, we dug a trench over there in order to establish what this feature was. That's really important, because at the east end of a church, you'd expect that that big cliff of masonry on the gables, the biggest weight of masonry, has to be taken by a substantial corner feature, a buttress, typically. OK, just stay, stay here for a minute. Come and tell us... You can come, come, come a bit further forward than that. Come and tell us, before they comment, what exactly you found here so far. Well, we, what we've got is a, a whacking great big wall coming right the way down through the trench. You can see the contrast between the mortar here of the wall and the brown soil of the natural, which is just outside the wall. And this wall comes all the way down here. It turns a right angle. Where Dan's digging, it's shooting off up in that direction. And then there's an immense buttress where Phil is cleaning, uh, again, sort of going right out the trench. So quite a, a huge structure. 
So John, an immense buttress, where is it and is it a garden feature? The geophysics is perfect. <laughs> it's bang on. I mean, yeah, OK, I got the interpretation wrong. What we're finding now is really interesting because it could suggest from that central pier base that we've got two churches side by side and that's why it's so wide. One for the nuns, one for the brothers. I wonder if Jonathan's proposals are roofed too far. But then this would have been a fabulous complex, and the clues just keep on coming up. Ah, Dan? What? I've got a piece of window glass. Oh, champion. It's only a small it fragment, is. look. It's the only one we've got, though, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> we've actually got definite evidence of, of windows. And at the east end. Mm. I don't know whether it's... I don't think there's it's any... It's not transparent anymore, is it? No. I'm just looking to see whether there's any decoration on it. I mean, a bit of that. Is that a, a pattern on it? Could that be? You see that little the sort of I yellow see. line? Could be a bit of muck. Oh, cynic, get back to your shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the skeptics have been won over, but you can tell Stuart is still not happy. John's got some new results, and it looks good for Jonathan. As you can see, we've got acres of parkland here that our archaeologists can investigate. So where have they decided to put their next trench? Right here in the driveway, slap bang in front of the house. Why are you being so disruptive? <laughs> Look, this is where we are on the map. This is the corner of the church with the wall coming down here. Now, we appear to have a junction at that point. If so, that's absolutely fascinating because yesterday, well, we found these two walls side by side and we put Eton College Chapel on top of it and it's, it's not just one of these, but it's two side by side. Let's have a look. Let's, let's put that in place and you can see there, these are the pillars we found running along the middle of it. So it's double the width of Eton. Well, if that's the case, you see Eton's got a nave here as well and John's geophysics shows that it bulges out at the same kind of point. Now, if that's just the chancel, and at this point is its junction with the nave, and it broadens out. What we've got is Cyan House just occupying the nave of the church. Whoa, 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 whoa. So that means that your church would not only go all the way past the digger in that direction, yeah. but all the way under this house, respecting the outside walls of the house. It does. And this is the critical point, because this is the junction between what we're saying is the nave and the chancel, so we need to see if we're right. If we've got something that big, how significant is that? I think it's the most extraordinary discovery of late medieval London and the region within living memory. That's my, that's my feeling. It's something the size of Salisbury Cathedral that history has forgotten about. And you thought it was a garden! <laughs> <laughs> so even the driveway goes in the pursuit of archaeology. In Trench 4, the foundations are wonderfully wide and crisp. Jonathan, can you spare me a minute? But something's worrying Phil. And what I've done is I've dug down the outside of the foundation to actually find out how deep the foundation trench is. Yep. Didn't want to go inside the building, so I thought I'd go outside. Look, the bottom of the foundation trench has just come round here, and it's the same level all the way round. That's a bit shallow, isn't it? It's not very deep, is it? It's certainly not as deep as I, I would have thought. We're about, what, four foot, four and a half foot below ground level? I mean, um, and, and, it, and it's sitting on this dark grey material which goes all the way around here. Yeah. It is shallower than I would have imagined, Phil. OK, well... Well, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> An interesting, maybe a spanner in the works, that one. <laughs> it certainly is. Foundations this shallow couldn't hold up a building this big. And what's more, in the new Trench 5, they've found a modern drain, not the nave of a church. Garden drain. <laughs> I've got my garden, then. But underneath, the wall of the medieval building's charging off under Cyan House. See if it still chugs straight on. Yeah. While we've all been concentrating on the church, Matt's been excavating the structure in Trench 2 on the lawn. It looks much more like a proper building, but Matt needs to go deeper. To the side of the house, Trench 3. This was opened first thing yesterday morning, but has produced very little, so we'll shut it down once it's been recorded. In the incident room, Carenza and Barney are looking at details of other Brigitine houses in mainland Europe to see if there's any similarity in their plans. 
From these, it may be possible to work out what Sion looked like and how big the church was. In Trench 5, Miles has come up with an astonishing find. It looks like a human skull. So where did this actually come from, Miles? Well, this was just uh, sitting here up against the edge of the section, just underneath all this uh, brick hardcore rubble. Right, because this is absolutely fantastic. There are bronze pins which have rotted and decayed next to the Still bone. Still adhering to it. And the only other place that I know of in, is another nunnery, medieval nunnery in Clementhorpe in York, where they found 10 of these. So this is some kind of head It's It's address. probably a headdress, and therefore this might be part of a, a nun. Finding a grave here by a wall would be even stronger evidence of this being a church. This is the only piece of the Sion Abbey buildings to survive. It was saved by the fleeing nuns in 1539 and is now a sacred relic, kept by the sisters in the modern Brigitine Monastery in Devon. To get a glimpse of the kind of skill and craftsmanship used to build Sion Abbey, Alex, our stonemason, is going to reproduce a detail from this original pinnacle. And then... Well, that don't look a very skilled job. Can I have a go? <laughs> of course you can. Of course you can. <laughs> Are you right-handed? No, I am. Yeah. So what just do I do? Pack place it that in at the there, bottom of that cut and, and then uh, just, just beat it a couple of times. Oh, I can cope with this. Yeah, it's... I'll tell you what, this is easier than flint napping. <laughs> <laughs> Softer, isn't it? Softer. <laughs> I think I'd better admit that this is really your skill than mine. I think I'd better get back to my skill in the trench. <laughs> I'll welcome. come back when you're into the intricate stuff. Right on. On an average day in the late 15th century, 30 stonemasons would have been working at Sion. The place was a building site for over a hundred years and Henry VI spared no expense. The Abbey Church alone cost over 20,000 pounds, a staggering figure when you think that a fine parish church at that time would have cost only 450 pounds. There was a library of over 1,400 books that attracted scholars from all over Europe, including Erasmus and Sir Thomas More. By the time of the dissolution in 1539, the Abbey was one of the wealthiest and most influential in Europe. But Henry VIII was no friend of this place when it came to his divorce. This was a great theological thinking place and they had said we can't justify it no it isn't justified it's against the law of God it's against all the papal laws it can't be justified Zion had Richard Reynolds who was an outstanding theologian and thinker and Richard Reynolds had said in confession that he was absolutely opposed to the king and Henry and Thomas Cromwell his chief advisor now absolutely target this place as a place they've got to bring down because this is where this is the powerhouse of opposition everything that's being argued against the king is coming from here and they succeeded in bringing it down. They had an inquiry here in which there was all sorts of fraudulent charges brought against the nuns and the monks. Nothing ever stuck. They took Richard Reynolds and charged him with treason and he went to a martyr's death with immense courage and told the people who were executed with him that they were having a sharp breakfast, but they would dine in heaven. I mean, it's a most wonderful story of Catholic martyrdom in England. In Trench 4, Jonathan's church theory is in huge trouble. John G. Fizz and Stuart have found out about the inadequate foundations, but Jonathan's fighting back. Now, look at the area here of this buttress. It's about 12 feet long. Now, that's enormous. And it could well be that because we're near a river on a fairly um, you know, marshy ground, we're looking at a big raft foundation, and the, and, the, and the weight is being distributed across these enormous buttresses. What diagnostic ecclesiastical features are here say, this is church, no argument? The nun with the pins on her skull? No, we know yeah. it's an ecclesiastical <laughs> site. You'd expect that. There's yes. no doubt about that. We're just having doubts about this being a church. Why can't At the moment, all we've got is a superb geophysics plan <laughs> with the buttress in the corner, but the only thing linking this wall and this wall is one central pier base that gives us a sort of roof between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one trench. I mean, if you take the bottom line of, of this, this plan, could you explain to me what in blue blazes it is if it isn't a church? 
I don't know. No, obviously <laughs> not, is the answer. I've got a real feeling of deja vu here. I'm going to have to ask you the question I asked you at exactly this time yesterday. Where can we put a trench in to establish whether we've got this monastic church or not? What do you want to, to, to convince I would you? like another central pier. Mm, like another central yeah. pier. Yeah. I, I, because I, you've manufactured a whole division on the church based on one pier. Mm. Which is absolutely central to these two walls. What about these other things here? Why? I, I, Why I, think, I, think, I think we're talking finer semantics here. We, know, we can see this is the church. We've confirmed it. More trenches mm. just find more walls on here, which we can see on your geophysics, which is very nice, by the way. Um, <laughs> we can see on there. <laughs> what we need to do is resolve the cloisters. If it's the church, yeah. OK, what, what, what well, is there? OK, look, put a trench across this away from the church wall, we'll see what that is. Put the digger in now? Yeah. With just an hour left? Definitely. Let's get on with All it. Right. So Trench 6 goes in. If there is a buttress among this tangle of geophys anomalies, then Miles is confident that should silence the cynics once and for all. But, of course, there's still the problem of the shallow foundations. To support such a large structure, Jonathan's worked out that at least eight foot would be needed below ground. Trench 5, the one in the path, has got that. But the foundations of the buttress, nearly 100 feet away, appear to be only half that deep. Henry's been called in to resolve the issue. They look to be deeper down here. Can you take a level? on this trench here, right. and then we'll go up there and do the same. Yeah, and we'll about actually the see whether or not the foundation trench is cut to the same level. Yeah, because it should be, shouldn't it, if it is the same. Got that? Yep, got that one. Well, if you stop here then, Jonathan, I'll give you a wave and I'll try and shout the results. Oh. Give out a wail if, if there's, if there's yeah, a problem. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> hey, my, my hat. <laughs> Now then, plonk your machine down on there. Right. It should be similar if it's the same foundation. Yeah. Right. Oh, you're talking about 10 centimetres or so different. This is, what, 10 centimetres? Lower, here. Well, that's peanuts. That's nothing, is it? Jonathan! 10 centimetres! That'll do for me! So, really, it is pretty much it's a level now. foundation. So Phil and Jonathan are back in business. Capability Brown built a slope into this garden. Personally, I'm now convinced this is a church, so all we need to win over the sceptics is another buttress in Trench 6 and a pillar base in the middle. Raysan got to work making a 3D reconstruction of the nun's skull that was found in Trench 5, showing how the pins would have fixed her headdress. The veil's still worn today by the few sisters who live at the Modern Abbey in Devon. It has a white cross decorated with red points, representing the five wounds of Christ. 500 years ago, the nuns at Sion would have been singing this Brigitine chant, quite possibly on this very spot. We've spent all day scrabbling around in the foundations of the church, which 600 years ago would have rung to beautiful sounds like those. But the church was only part of a vast monastic complex. It was also a centre of political intrigue and opposition to the king. And where did all that plotting and planning take place? In the cloisters. Not just corridors of worship, but corridors of power. Can we find them? Join us after the break. Beginning of day three in our search for the monastic complex here at Sion Park, and today we're shifting our focus. We think we've already nailed down where the monastery church is, but now we're going to look over here for the cloisters. Why should I get excited about cloisters? Aren't they just four corridors and a bit of grass in the middle? Uh, technically, yes, it's an open uh, courtyard with a passageway around it, but the key thing about the cloisters is beyond the church, it's the main focus 
for the Abbey building. So if we're looking for the chapter house, the refectory, all the other key structures, they're going to be set around the cloisters. So once we find that, we should start locking down other buildings and start interpreting John's geophysics plan. By the corner of the house, the plan clearly shows two parallel walls. Miles is opening trench seven, and there's already something there. It's a nice bit of masonry. That's some of the best you've seen outside the church, actually. That could very well be the cloisters. <laughs> this is our first clue that we've found the cloisteral range. But of course, there's still some unfinished business on the church. What John needs is another pillar base, and he's brought in his radar. If there's a feature here, John should be persuaded this was a building with a huge roof. Phil's been chasing a huge jumble of geophysical anomalies in Trench 6. Miles hopes that it'll be the buttress, but Jonathan suggested it could be a bell tower. All Phil's found so far is some of the Tudor garden. Well, we'll have that, Pat. Sion Abbey was a huge medieval pilgrimage centre, almost as popular as Canterbury and Walsingham. Thousands of pilgrims a year visited Sion. What made it such a magnet that people wanted to come here? I think there are three factors. One was the proximity of the royal court, so it was sort of right in the centre of uh, uh, the political world in a way. But probably more important than that was the fact that the Abbey had papal indulgences, so that people who came on pilgrimage got real spiritual benefits immediately just for coming to the, to the shrine. A papal indulgence is when you're given a bit of time off in purgatory, yeah, fast track yeah. through purgatory to get to heaven quicker. If you come to the abbey and make an offering to, for the upkeep of the abbey and to the uh, betterment of the, uh, the saint, then you will get something back in return. And it worked on a quid pro quo. And then the third thing was this was an absolute sort of spiritual powerhouse in Britain and the library of 1,400 books, books actually being written, devotional literature, which would have been known the length and breadth of the country. So it was a well-advertised uh, um, pilgrimage site. But we have... This site's also produced some really juicy small finds. I think several of these are contemporary with the monastery. There are fragments of Tudor green appearing. This came from uh, near the church. That's the sort of classic late medieval wares. Yes, that's right. It's quite... The old name for it's Tudor green, it's southern whiteware, it's 16th century, uh, uh, a rather attractive little jar. They're very finely made, probably Surrey, Hampshire area would, would be where the kilns were from. But honestly, the most exciting one, the one I've never found anything like this before, and it's absolutely brilliant, and that's this. It doesn't look very much, does it? Now, are these part of spectacles? That's right. They're incredibly rare, aren't they? Yes, it would have been a folding set, so it would have been quite small, but held at the waist, perhaps on a chain. And there are fewer than a dozen examples in England. It would have been expensive, probably, if they were imported from Italy. I never really thought of Victor as a medieval fashion victim, but they are very fetching. Geophys have put down their mark, and with less than two hours left, Kerry and Ian have opened our last trench to find another pillar base, the final piece of evidence needed to convince the most sceptical of sceptics. John has been wavering over the church for three days, but he won't accept Jonathan's theory until he's found another pillar base. Over at the side of the house, the cloisters are taking shape. In Trench 2, we've got the only standing structure we've found at Sion and must have been part of the accommodation for the monks or nuns. But what exactly this building was, we're not sure yet. In Trench 7, on the corner of the house, they now think they've found the cloisteral range. A monk or nun would have lived in a cell on one side of the cloister and they were often laid to rest under the passageway. We think we're digging here. Where they buried people then, underneath the cloisters? The, the monks and the nuns tend to get buried in the cloisters, in the chapter house and uh, those sort of general areas, yeah. Not in the church? No, the sort of highest status ones get buried in the church, the benefactors of the church right. are buried there. Just under the Tudor garden features in Trench 6, there's a huge corner foundation, similar to the one on the other side in Trench 4. The sceptics have nothing to doubt, especially now that Kerry's found the demolition rubble in Trench 8 associated with another pillar base. 
This is one of four features on the geophys, so there's enough evidence to suggest that these were columns supporting a huge roof and that this must have been a big building. Hi, Miles. It's Tony. Are you receiving? Over. Miles, Tony here. Hi, Tony. You might want to pop along to uh, 27. I think we've got something of interest for you. Over. You going to tell me what it is? Absolutely not. You've got to come over and have a look. OK. <laughs> Miles? Is this the other wall we were looking for? Yes, indeed. Yeah, so we've got the cloister. Well, hopefully, yeah. This is the wall that appeared in the, on the geophysics that Bridget's cleaning up here. But, but, far more important than that. Remember this morning when I was saying about one of the key things you like to find inside the cloister was human burial? Wow. Well, that's exactly what we've got. Fantastic. Do we know what sex they are? Um, unfortunately, there's not an awful lot of the skull left, as you can see, but we've got a nice rounded forehead, um, no brow ridges to speak of, so it looks pretty female to me, although I want a bit more and I want to see the pelvis if possible. Any other finds? Yes, there are other finds. Um, can you see these here? Orangish things are actually coffin nails, and there was one in this one as well. So this is pretty conclusive evidence that um, we've actually got a coffin and not a shroud burial. Why have we got so many skulls and yet so few other bones? Well, it is interesting, and I've, and I've given a little bit of thought. I think they must have been wearing uh, a hood either made of leather or cloth stuffed with straw or something like that, and the rest of the body's gone, but the, the, the hood's protected the head, and hence it stayed in the hole. So if Alice is right, this cloister would have housed the nuns of Sion, or at least until Henry VIII got rid of them. When the nuns left here, what happened to this place? It was probably left, as it were, empty, but it was certainly enough of a building and it had enough sanctity left to it that when Henry VIII died and his coffin was brought back, it was left in the what had been the chapel overnight. Is that the story about the blood? It is the story about the blood. That's every schoolboy's story about the blood. The background to the story is that a priest being interrogated by Henry warned him that he must not proceed on the course against the monasteries, against the Pope, ultimately against God. And if he did so, then he would be punished as an Old Testament character, Achab, whose uh, body was eaten by dogs on his death. And of course, Henry did proceed, and in dramatic fulfillment of this prophecy, his, apparently his coffin is left here overnight. It's, although it's lead-lined, it leaks, and the blood goes down to the floor, and dogs come in and eat Henry's blood. It's wonderfully vivid, but would Henry's coffin really have been left unattended overnight? It's such a great story. It's, we've got a source for it. There is a record that says this indeed happened. I think it's fairly unlikely. He was a very well-regarded King of England. I can't believe they just bundled it in here and you know, went off for a pint. But standing here in the undercroft of the house, it feels like it's got to be true, doesn't it? It's such a great story. I don't think we can just lose it. We asked Alex Wenham to make us a stone figure. It's almost finished. Oh, paintbrush in hand, eh? Just cleaning up now. Oh, you finished it? Well, my time's up, so I've had to stop. That is absolutely magnificent. Thank you. Pleased with it? Yeah, I'm pleased with what I've got done in the time, you know. So have you learned anything from it? Well, I've learned that I can get a little figure like this done in two and a half days, and before I probably would have thought that it had taken a bit longer. But yeah, I've got all sorts of respect for the, the medieval masons who made this the first time round. You know, it's just dawned on me. What you've actually achieved is only one half of one facet, of one stone, of one gatepost for one of the largest monastic buildings in Britain. That's right. <laughs> Do you fancy him finishing it off? I think it would take me a long time. <laughs> Trench 2 is about to reveal its dark secret. Jonathan and Barney may be the first to look down here for nearly 500 years. So these are the two walls we saw yesterday with the passageway in between, but that passageway has got a hole through the floor. <laughs> Not a passageway. That's fantastic. We could, well, it's, it's a vault. It's vaulted, it's brick, it's running right the way into the darkness, and it's filled with some stuff. That's like a Hampton Court <laughs> culvert, actually, but full of soil. So this must be the guard robe, the latrine block for the nuns, basically. Makes sense off the cloister, doesn't it? Yeah, so... absolutely. <clears throat> and so, well, where Matt's fishing like an Eskimo now, that's, yeah. the, that's the long culvert yeah. that carries all the waste away. And is that then an individual 
latrine or toilet? Well, I think it must be. That must be where the waste goes down into the main drain. Brilliant. Well, uh, what about dating? Do you have got any stratigraphy? Well, as far as we can see, it seems that the, the, it's completely sealed by this huge dump of demolition rubble. Mm. Therefore, it's got to be earlier than the demolition of the abbey, so it must be late medieval or Tudor. It's got to be monastic, isn't it? Well, excellent. That's, and that's great. And this is actually, actually the first piece of the cloisters that we've been able to identify. And it looks on the geophys here as if it runs for about 15 metres. You can see we're here, and it's mm. running 10 metres behind us and 5 metres in that direction. That's a lot of loose, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. we can plan everything out from this now. Yeah, here's the, the nun's dormitory with what we now think is the latrine block here. Yeah. And this would be the whole cloister with the church running through here. That looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. It's the best I've seen in this site, actually, yeah. by long chalk. Richard, the estate manager, um, said he'd got a cellar. Stuart's been crawling about underneath the house and is about to drop a bombshell. Why am I not surprised? Looks a bit okay. perilous, yeah. <laughs> it is, it is wrong. Am I going to survive? We've already got a torch rigged up to, to help. Now, all right? Yeah. Now, have a, just have a look at this wall down Ooh. just over here. You see the, the stonework? Well, these are nice. So look, you've got these big stones all coursed in, little tiles there to bring them up level, and they go right the way down to the floor there. What do you think now, that's it is? all good, solid. Medieval stone and tile and bits of brick. Now, I like this, this a lot. This is the kind of stuff we should be looking at and the original construction that once sat in those robber trenches we're looking at outside, but we're following it now through under the house. Well, what makes this really interesting from my point of view is, is where it is, because yeah. Henry came down and, and has planned where it is in relation to the building. Can you shine your torch on this? Sure. I think you might like this. This is the, the house we're in. Yeah. This green line here is the line of the, the wall. Now look at what it lines up with on the outside of the building. Look at that. That's yes. bang on, isn't it? Absolutely crack on. And that actually that's in incredibly important because we haven't got off the lawn before. Now this trench that we found, we continue it this far under the house. It shows that the wall of this house is built on top of it, reusing the old foundations, and it gives us a minimum length for the building. So if that's 120 foot, we're talking about at least 260 foot overall length of the church. We've got a whopper on our hands, haven't we? What an irony. Stuart, the arch-skeptic, has finally confirmed Jonathan's theory. Three days ago, we knew almost nothing about Sion Abbey. We now know there was a church here and how big it was. We believe the nuns lived on the south side with an infirmary and chapel. And we assume the monks were housed on the other side. We can work out where the nuns might have slept and where the monks' world-famous library might have been. It's been a bumpy ride for Jonathan. He was right all along about the size and position of the church, but he has changed his mind about what it looked like. However, the learning curve has just got much steeper because having found that single pier between these two walls, do you remember on the first day we were looking at getting interested in these but thought they were garden features? Well, they're not. This has now turned out to be another pier. So what we've got is one, two, three, four. And then that is separated from that and we have to be able to manage the junction between that space and this one. This is three aisles, that one looks like it's two. Sion Abbey Church was 260 feet long and 108 feet wide with a single pitched roof and was one of the largest monastic buildings in England, twice the width of King's College Chapel, Cambridge. The view from the River Thames must have been breathtaking. Jonathan thinks the pillar base we found in Trench 1 was a footing for a central column that supported a large platform at the east end of the church. The nuns held their services here, separated from the monks below. For us, this has been an extraordinary and enigmatic mystery to unravel. But our experts tell us that what we've found here at Sion Park could be the greatest monastic discovery of modern times.